Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live stream event as we discuss one of the latest treatment options for COPD, the Zephyr valve, which is a minimally invasive procedure to help breathing and quality of life. My name is Ed Bottomley with the Department of Communication, and our panel today includes two University of Michigan Health pulmonology specialists and a patient who received the Zephyr valve treatment. Welcome, Dr. Wasim Labaki, Dr. Jose de Cardenas, and a patient for, here with us too, Janice Bright. So I'll pass off to you first, uh, Dr. Labaki, for a quick hello and an introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Wasim Labaki. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine here at the University of Michigan. I have uh, clinical and research interests in COPD. I'm uh, a, a provider in the multidisciplinary COPD clinic, as well as a member of the COPD Quality Improvement Committee. And I just enjoy working with um, people with COPD, help improve their lives and help them achieve their goals. Fantastic. It's great to have you with us. Uh, let's pass over to Dr. De Cardenas for an intro. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Jose De Cardenas, and uh, I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Michigan. I have, uh, I'm extremely lucky to um, participate in this institution and also take care of uh, a lot of patients with COPD. Uh, my major interest is in advanced techniques, um, minimal invasive procedures that can, that can help uh, with the quality of life in patients. So uh, happy to be here. And we're happy to have you here. And then uh, quickly to Janice for a hello. Hello there, my name is Janice Bright. And I was one of the first patients at the U of M received my Zephyr valves two years ago, as a matter of fact, by these two wonderful doctors, and I've been doing great ever since. Thank you so much. Well, it's a real privilege to have all three of you with us today. Before we start, just a few housekeeping items. You can submit questions at any time for our panel to answer during the Q&A portion of today's chat. Questions can be submitted by commenting on this video, but please note that if you do so, your name or your profile name will be visible to others participating. Now, if you prefer a more anonymous option, you can also send us a private message via Facebook. If you can't stay for the whole chat, or you want to share this chat with a, with a friend, a video of the chat in its entirety will be available on our Michigan Medicine YouTube channel afterwards. So let's kick off with some basics. Um, so let's move on to our Zephyr valve live stream questions. And our first, first question is, what is COPD? Yes, so... To, to, uh, to give a brief overview of how the lungs work, um, you know, when, when someone uh, breathes in, you know, air goes through their mouth and inside what we call an airway tree. So the airways are pretty much windpipes. And you can think of your airway tree as an inverted tree that keeps branching and branching and branching, you know, through these windpipes. So they can deliver the air to all the parts of the lungs. And the lung, you know, is made of um, parenchyma or tissue. And uh, uh, at the very basic level, it is made of millions and millions of tiny units or tiny sacs that we call alveoli. And once air reaches those alveoli, this is where gas exchange occurs, meaning uh, the, uh, the oxygen contained in, in the air goes inside the blood. And at the same time, the carbon dioxide that is in the blood, which is a waste gas, is pushed back into the air so we can breathe it out. And this is how our lungs work. So COPD, which stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is damage at the level of either the airways, the lung tissue itself, or both. And the major risk factor for COPD is cigarette smoking, but there are also other risk factors other than smoking. For example, exposure to dust, fumes, and chemicals as part of someone's job or abnormal lung growth during someone's childhood or adolescence. And uh, like I said, it, uh, it can be damage to the airways, lung tissue, or both. Now, when 
damage happens at the level of the airways. These airways, you know, get uh, uh, thickened. Their, their walls get thick. They get filled with mucus. And uh, this is an entity we generally call chronic bronchitis, which we should differentiate, you know, from the typical acute bronchitis when someone is acutely sick. Chronic bronchitis is damaged at the level of the airways and manifests with a chronic cough, chronic mucus production, shortness of breath. Contrast this to uh, damage that is not at the level of the airways, damage that is at the level of the lung tissue. And uh, this is what we call emphysema. And basically emphysema is destruction of that lung tissue, whereas healthy lung tissue is able to push air out in an adequate way. And you can think of emphysema as destroyed lung tissue that is kind of floppy, that traps air, that is not able to exert this adequate force to uh, push air out, which ends up being in extra air being retained in the lung and causing symptoms like shortness of breath. So basically, um, people with COPD can have uh, damage at the level of the airways, at the level of the lung tissue or both, damage at the level uh, of the airways we call chronic bronchitis, damage of the, uh, the level of the lung tissue we call emphysema. Some people have one or the other, some people have both, but this is important because certain therapies are uh, targeted towards one versus the other. And as we will talk about later, you know, the Zephyr valve specifically helps with the emphysema component of things. Yet, yet both are under the umbrella of COPD, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. It's just uh, at what level the damage occurs. Thank you so much for that. Anything to add, Dr. De Cardenas? No, I think uh, Wasim um, explained that really well. And just to reiterate, is uh, COPD is basically um, has two major components: bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. In case of the sacral valve, um, they are dealing mostly, or they try to help uh, for those patients who have emphysema, severe emphysema. Thank you. Thank you for that. Our, our next question that we have up, what are the treatment options for COPD? Yeah, great question. So uh, the backbone of uh, uh, therapy or medical therapy in COPD is inhaler therapy. And, uh, you know, inhaler come in, uh, inhalers come in different classes, but broadly speaking, uh, it would be bronchodilators, which means medications that are inhaled to dilate the airways, you know, to help uh, uh, relieve some of that obstruction at the level of airways so uh, people can breathe better in and most importantly out. And another class of inhalers is uh, inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, and basically they decrease the inflammation, you know, at the level of the lung to also help improve breathing. So inhaler therapy is uh, the initial therapy and really the main component of therapy uh, in, in COPD. Now, additional therapies can be added, for example, pulmonary rehabilitation, which we uh, highly encourage for all our patients with COPD. It's basically uh, a, a comprehensive program where um, people uh, participate in aerobic exercising, uh, muscle training, nutrition education, as well as education on inhalers, breathing technique, uh, education on uh, uh, COPD, for example, to you know, help increase their exertional capacity and ha help improve their quality of life. And then, uh, you know, depending on each patient's situation, there are other treatments that could be added. For example, oxygen, supplemental oxygen for people who have low oxygen levels because of their COPD. Uh, or, uh, for example, certain oral medications that can be given to people who have recurrent flare-ups of their COPD, and certainly more advanced interventional therapies like Zephyr valve or lung transplantation. Thanks so much for that. Um, our next question that we have up, at what point during my care might a Zephyr valve be a good treatment option? So we, uh, we recommend the Zephyr valve for any patients with COPD who are, uh, continue to experience a high burden of shortness of breath or symptoms despite being on adequate inhaler therapy. Uh, and we recommend it for people with severe COPD, which is something we can detect on uh, breathing tests. 
So, so basically, people with uh, more severe COPD who continue to have significant limitations in terms of shortness of breath, despite being on adequate inhaler therapy and despite completing pulmonary rehabilitation. Dr. De Cardenas, anything to add? I saw you nodding. Yeah, so I think it's important to um, stress out that uh, safety valves are uh, for a very specific um, selective group of people um, to start. Um, and I think we have to stress uh, this out. The patient has to have severe COPD, has to be symptomatic despite compliance of uh, his medication. So um, we need to target um, uh, the valve placement or the, these um, uh, endoscopic procedures for patients who are already very compliant, have quit smoking, and have, despite all our efforts, right? Because one of the things is we don't want to intervene when there's still room for non, uh, you know, non aggressive therapies, um, right? So, uh, compliance is very, very important. And there is going to be a series of tests that we will need to run uh, in order to check eligibility for those patients. One, for example, is a breathing test that and the majority of pulmonologists will order in order to determine if there is COPD and what is the degree. Another one is, for example, uh, the six minute walk test that will allow us how much is the functional capacity of the patient. And at the same time, uh, during that test, we perform a blood gas, which is uh, with a super tiny needle, we check how um, the um, degree of um, oxygen and also the retention of um, CO2 the patient has. And uh, finally, also it's very important to have a CAT scan that will allow us to uh, check for other processes that might explain the shortness of breath and as well to see if the patient is a candidate for valves. Thank you very much for that. That was a, that was a nice uh, overview of some of the other elements about eligibility and things like that. And it, it's definitely worth highlighting. Then the next question, which you, you both touched on a little bit, what are Zephyr valves? Can we delve a little bit more into that? Um, Zephyr valves are, um, uh, it's a novel approach uh, that uh, has been studied for many, many years, but uh, basically, those are uh, very tiny um, implant and devices um, made of nitinol that are placed in, um, <clears throat> on average, um, four to five of those valves are placed into the airways, into the bronchi, which are the branches of uh, the main um, windpipe, um, in order to block, uh, to basically let air out Right, so and, uh, uh, and not allowing um, the air going. So one of the things that we um, and um, if you allow me, I'm just going to show a little bit of my chest. Uh, one of the points with COPD is that um, the lung is usually like a balloon, uh, air balloon that uh, usually inhales and exhales. We become bigger and smaller. And one of the points with COPD is that um, the lungs become very very big. And we have a big muscle called diaphragm. And that's our major a pump to breathe. Uh, one, of the, um, um, one of the factors that it, um, is associated with shortness of breath is when the diaphragm is pushed down because the, let's say when I breathe in, it goes down, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. But because the lungs are super hyper big, they're pushed down very much. And that creates a lot of shortness of breath. So um, our goal, as Dr. Lamaki mentioned, um, there are different techniques besides bronchodilators, which is the medications that the patient will be using uh, in order to address this, what we call hyperinflation. So meaning the extra size of the lungs. One is um, besides a treatment, a pulmonary rehab that works really well. Another uh, type of therapy, which is invasive and has been studied for more than 20 years is long volume reduction surgery, which is invasive. And one alternative besides transplant is the valves. The valves basically target one specific area of the lung that is the most diseased one 
and makes it smaller. So the diaphragm can adapt a normal shape, recover uh, the position that it was before. And therefore the patient is able to breathe in an easier fashion, feeling less short of breath. Wasim? Yes, uh, I, I agree with uh, everything uh, Dr. De Cardenas uh, mentioned. And again, to, to clarify, the valves would target the, um, the most diseased area of the lung, and specifically that area that has been affected by emphysema, which is what we were talking about, some lung destruction to the point that these um, the lung is uh, trapping a lot of air just because it has become so floppy. And because it traps a lot of air, it gets bigger and bigger in an abnormal way, which we call, you know, uh, hyperinflation and air trapping. And because it gets bigger and becomes abnormal, one, it cannot contribute effectively to gas exchange. But not only that, it can compress other areas of the lung that are relatively healthy and prevent them from doing their work in terms of helping with breathing and gas exchange. Therefore, once we place these, the Zephyr valves, which are the, these one-way valves, uh, inside the airways leading to that uh, diseased area, because these are one-way valves, air over time will get out of this area but cannot get in. So what will happen, because air can, can only get out, this uh, diseased area of the lung will get smaller, 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 and eventually compress because it's losing all that extra air. And this is the goal. This is the goal. The goal is to compress it. And once you compress it, you allow the other areas of the lung, which are healthier, to expand and contribute to breathing and gas exchange, which results in you know, improved uh, symptoms and health. Thank you both for that overview. I think that was fantastic. We're now going to move to two or three questions for you, Janice. And my first question for you is, what was your experience before and after the procedure? Well, my experience before was, it was beautifully explained to me what was happening to my body, and what the Zephyr valves could do for me. And was I scared? Yes, I was scared, but the procedure was just minimal. Um, and after I woke up, I was scared for a while, but then um, I started taking the oxygen off little by little and I walked the hallways and every day I felt better and better because every day, it was like a complete, I woke up and said, what am I doing? What is this? And the nurse said, you're taking a deep breath, Jan. And I have been taking deep breaths ever since. It's the most fabulous gift that you can have done for yourself. That's lovely to hear, Janice, and it's lovely to see the smiles on our doctors' faces here on this panel. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but in terms of time scale, how long after the valve procedure did you start to feel better? Um, after I got home, um, I started feeling better by the time I got out of the hospital, actually. Me and the nurse got caught taking my um, oxygen off and got yelled at, but we were just trying to see how long I could go without it. And we got a little bit of trouble, but it was fabulous. I think I was going 20 minutes. And then of course I had to get a little nervous, but and I put it back on. By the time I got home, I, which was five days, I start leading it off for hours at a time. And then I would go to pulmonary rehab and wear my oxygen because I was nervous. And a friend of mine said, basically, you have one lung functioning, Jan. He said, I had one lung transplant. He said, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you know that you're fine. Stop using your oxygen. for." He said, take it with you, but stop using it as long as you can. And here I am. I do use my oxygen at night. It's on two. And that's because my doctors recommended me to do that. So. 
Fantastic. And and another another question for you, Janice. Are there things you couldn't do before the procedure that you can do now? Oh Lord. My biggest thing before the procedure is my granddaughters were in softball and I was raising them. I could not go to their games. Um, I had a portable unit, but it maybe an hour and a half into their games, and we're talking a double header. And that just broke my heart. And um, I couldn't couldn't cook. That's my most favorite thing to do. Cook and bake. I couldn't bend over to get the laundry out of the washer. I had to get a grab meat, pull the laundry out. I couldn't walk and down up and down our deck, which was five steps without just about collapsing. I was everywhere. I had oxygen on 24 seven. And it was very depressing to tell you the truth. And my grandkids and my friends always all said to me, it's okay, grandma, because we love you. It's okay, you're going to be fine. When I got the opportunity, I jumped for it. Absolutely jumped for it. And I can do all those things now. I mean, granted, you still have COPD in the other lung, and it is going to advance a little by little. But this is fabulous. I don't even take my oxygen to go shopping. Maybe I should, but I don't. And my daughter's always saying, you want your go-to tank? No, I'm all right. But yeah, do I get tired once in a while? Yes, but I'm 71 years old. Who wouldn't? Thank you so much for that, Janice. Those those answers were fantastic. It was it was lovely to see the nods and the smiles from the doctors too. And any comments? I, I saw that you unmuted for a second, Doctor De Cardenas. Yeah, I think uh, we're so happy that uh, Janice has done so well, and we have made a significant uh, positive impact in her life and the life of her around her family. Um, I think, though, uh, I wanted to point out two really good teaching points of her case. The first one is that she points out that despite having the valve placement, she continued using her medications. She continued doing a restarted pulmonary rehab, and that's very important. And as well, she continues having follow-up, in some cases, titrating down her oxygen, etc. But again, the compliance is very, very important. When we put the valve, it doesn't mean that uh, you are going to stop using all your medication. This will help you to breathe better. And that goes into the second teaching point as well. Um, the valves um, are not perfect. And uh, we can talk about uh, things that also, um, the downsides of the valves, um, but we're still studying and learning in what patients um, are best suited. Um, but uh, one of the things that the valve have already um, um, Proof already in four big trials um, in studies is that first um, and most importantly, the quality of life will improve significantly. And that's, I think, our major role for our patients, right? Um, and we can care about numbers, but the most important thing is how the patient feels, right? So that's already proven that when the good collapse of the bad lung occurs due to the valve, patients are able to have a better quality of life. The second one is uh, they are less short of breath, right? And that's also important. And the third one is um, that the breathing tests also improve. And uh, we're a little bit, uh, um, um, objective uh, because we're, we like numbers and that also uh, drive us to do more studies. But again, better quality of life, less shortness of breath and improvement overall objectively uh, with, when we do the breathing tests that uh, occur with the valves. We cannot promise you though that it will, you will be off of oxygen and that's important, right? Uh, I cannot promise you that. Um, uh, Ms. Janice is a good example that she was able, right? But every case is different, and I want to point that out. 
Uh, Dr. Lavaki, any other comments? Yeah, I would say that Janice's experience is overall in line with what was seen in clinical trials, uh, you know, specifically improved quality of life, uh, increased walk distance, and improved lung function. And, uh, and again, I want to reiterate that, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of your oxygen does not always happen. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Some people were able to go off oxygen. Some people were not able to go off oxygen. And that's okay. You still get all the other benefits in terms of improved shortness of breath, improved, um, you know, physical endurance, you know, but some people will still need to be on oxygen for, uh, uh, for, for other reasons, you know, because they still have, you know, COPD or emphysema in uh, their, their, their other lung or for uh, cardiac related reasons. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really on a case by case basis when it, when it comes to oxygen. And again, I would like to emphasize one more time that uh, this therapy works in the suitable patient with COPD. Uh, you, you must meet certain criteria. You must have the emphysema kind of COPD and uh, you must have a specific lobe or area inside the lung that can be targeted by these valves to be able to derive the benefits. Thank you. Thank you for those points, doctors. And I have a few questions for you now. Is there an age limit for receiving this treatment? How about, say, patients over 80? I think there is a case by case. Um, um, Every patient is different. If, for example, the patient has um, no ma major other uh, other major comorbidities, I think it's uh, feasible. Uh, the initial studies are put to a limit of age, but um, there are some other reports that, for example, if a patient is going to have um, is expected to live five extra years, uh, not related to COPD, meaning that they only have COPD and no other problems, uh, because one of the thing is doing the procedure, but is the patient able to tolerate the procedure, right? Um, so meaning that the patient is not in a wheelchair, doesn't have a major heart problem. Yes, he might benefit if he meets all other criteria. Yeah, so basically, uh, many of the studies on the valve in COPD uh, enrolled uh, participants uh, uh, with age up to 75 years. Uh, but uh, in practice, uh, we certainly consider uh, patients older than 75 when we look at the whole clinical picture, you know, including, uh, uh, you know, what other medical conditions they have uh, and what is their overall clinical status. So uh, we will look at all patients. Thank you. Thank you for those clarifications. To get the Zephyr valve, do I need to quit smoking? That's our next question. Yes, uh, we we certainly recommend uh, and uh, and require actually that someone quit smoking for at least um, uh, you know for a month before uh, uh, getting the valve uh, placed. And the reason for that is because uh, smoking creates a uh, state of uh, continuous inflammation or chronic inflammation inside the lungs. And uh, when we go in and place these valves inside the lung. This is still, you know, a direct intervention on, on the lungs themselves. So you want the lungs to be in the uh, healthiest state possible, you know, without any, uh, I mean, to minimize any ongoing inflammation, let's say from cigarette smoking. And, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, yes, it is a requirement to quit smoking before the procedure. And not only that, we may get into this later, but uh, uh, the, uh, some complications of this procedure includes a pneumothorax, which is basically... A, a, uh, a you know uh, a, a long you know puncturing and deflating you know which can happen uh, in uh, one third to one fourth of the cases and uh, this is a, a complication that you know we see we can see you know uh, commonly with the valves so uh, and th therefore to be able to sustain that complication in a in a, in a better way. Uh, uh, smoking, uh, stopping smoking, you know, would be would be very important. So if this were to happen, your lungs are in the best shape possible to one sustain the procedure, but also sustain any resulting complications. Doctor De Cardenas, would you like to add anything? Yes, uh, and um, just also to point out um, what things um, the valves can produce besides. Right. So once the valve, the one of the benefits of the valves is that yes, 
is a non-invasive procedure. So you will wake up with a no cutting, no scars from um, outside. We go with a tiny camera and we put around four to five um, endobronchial valves within the lung. But as Dr. Lavaki mentioned, around one third, meaning one of every three patients will have what we call a pneumothorax, which is uh, what we call, um, let's call it a bad lung collapse. And uh, let me explain to you why that happened. So as I said, sorry for showing my chest again. Um, and we always target one lung, okay? And um, we cannot target both. And that's a major difference as well. We always target one lung and the most disease part. So let's say that I'm occluding, I'm gonna put valves in the upper part of the lung. And when I put the valves, this part becomes smaller and smaller. And the other part of the lung that was not occluded start expanding a little bit more. And if the expansion occurs a little bit quick, um, there can be a tear in the surface of the lung. And that's when there is some air leak. In the majority of cases, um, not in all of them, we need to put a tiny uh, tube, um, a thinner than um, a pen, which we can put right away under local anesthesia. And that will allow the lung uh, to expand and that air out to come out. And the tube, that tiny tube called a small ball pigtail, um, only stays for a couple of days. Um, in some rare cases, we will stay uh, for uh, longer than that one or two weeks, but it usually comes out. And uh, that and that's importance of also having a patient who has stopped smoking, who is able to tolerate. Um, that's why we're talking about other comorbidities that will allow him to tolerate that complication. And also, and that's a reason why we don't do this as an outpatient. These complications called pneumothoraces will occur within the first couple of days, and usually within three, the first three days. And that's why we keep them as inpatient. And our commitment is basically making sure that if there is any hiccup, bump, along the road after the procedure were available for the patient, right? And that's why it's a team effort, as we said. We also have to have the patients with a family around them. So if there is any complication at home two weeks after, they're able to um, bring them to the closest emergency department uh, to have them checked. Thank you so much, both of you, for that. Uh, the next question, something that you touched on a little bit, but worth worth delving into. Are there people who can't have the Zephyr valve treatment? Yes, there are other um, um, uh, options. And as I said, um, patients with severe COPD, let's put it this way, there are a um, couple of options. One is continued and optimizing as much as we can the medical therapy. And for that reason, we have, uh, at Michigan, we're very fortunate to have a dedicated group of uh, researcher clinicians who um, take care of patients with severe COPD. That's their focus, right? Uh, the other option is, and Dr. Lavaki might explain a little bit this, um, is long volume reduction surgery, which again, um, is a, it has been more studied longer uh, because it has been there in the market for a longer period of time, um, but it's more invasive. Then we have the valves, right? Which is relatively new uh, and that we just explained. And then we have also lung transplant as well, which we usually reserve um, for as a last resort and for a very specific type of patient. And uh, maybe Dr. Lavaki might explain also that there are some upcoming uh, clinical trials and that uh, some patients might be considered if they need criteria. Thank you, Dr. De Cardenas. So, uh, so like we said before, um, the, the valve, I mean, you need to be a candidate for the valve, meaning not all people with COPD will be candidates for the valve. And this may happen in a number of situations. For example, your medical therapy is not optimized yet, in which your your lung doctor will work closely with you, you know, to optimize your medical therapy, including your medications and other important referrals, such as referral to pulmonary rehabilitation. 
Another reason why, why you may not be a candidate for the valve is if you do not have severe COPD as the, uh, shown on the breathing tests that you do in an office setting, in which case, you know, the valve may not have enough benefit. Uh, another category of COPD patients that uh, may not benefit for the valves is uh, people who have primarily disease at the level of their airways, not at the level of their lung tissue, because these uh, valves are targeted to help people specifically with lung tissue damage, which is basically emphysema. So, um, so, it, so, so it depends. It could be that some people are not sick enough, you know, to get the valves at this at this point. It does not mean that they will never get them because uh, for many people, COPD progresses, and it may be the case that in a few years they would become good candidates for the valves, uh, or or it may be that they do not have the right uh, type of COPD, if you will, which is emphysema in this case for them to benefit for the valves. So, uh, so in that, and this is where we start considering other options, uh, many of which Dr. De Cardenas mentioned. There is the lung volume reduction surgery, which is basically the same idea of the valve, getting rid of the most diseased or uh, a part of the lung, which has the most emphysema, but this is done through a, a surgery, a thoracic surgery, uh, where basically uh, the upper parts of your lungs on, you know, on both sides are shaved off because these are the most diseased areas. So uh, uh, we, uh, we would uh, you know, evaluate uh, uh, such uh, patients for this procedure as well. Uh, other options include you know, lung transplantation in, in uh, some of the uh, most uh, sick patients with COPD. And uh, there are always you know, clinical trials. You know, and uh, I do encourage our um, patients watching today uh, to look into, uh, you know, the clinical trials uh, we have to offer. And I will mention that uh, some therapies like the valves themselves were at some point, you know, investigational. And it's only through clinical trials that we learn that uh, they can help and benefit some patients with COPD. So uh, we always have a number of clinical trials ongoing at the University of Michigan. And, uh, and uh, I'm talking about COPD specifically, where uh, uh, on a regular basis, you know, we have uh, trials of either oral drugs, subcutaneous injections, or a bronchoscopic procedures. And, uh, uh, you, you know, you, uh, you may meet criteria for one or more of these trials. So I definitely encourage you to uh, check uh, what trials we are offering right now and, uh, and see if you would be interested in, 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 in one of them. And again, it could be the case that uh, you meet criteria for one trial, uh, or it could be the case that you meet criteria for more than one trial, you know, in, in which case, if you're interested in participating, you would uh, enroll in a uh, trial that uh, uh, seems more, more appealing to you. And it could also be the case that you do not meet uh, any uh, criteria for any trials we're offering at this time, but I do encourage you to check back in a few months because we always have new, new trials coming up. Go for it, Dr. Cardenas. Um, I have to say something that uh, um, we're very proud of. Um, uh, here at Michigan Medicine, we're um, extremely lucky to have a very collaborative team um, that um, I think right now is led by Dr. Lavaki for many years, and that's called the LDRS uh, Conference, where we, every two weeks, we have a, a list of patients with severe COPD that um, are discussed in a multidisciplinary fashion. We have COPD specialists, we have radiologists, we have lung transplant surgeons, we have also uh, thoracic surgeons that are focused on, on lung volume reduction surgery, also interventional pulmonologists, we have a cadre of uh, respiratory therapies as well as uh, nurses who help us to define what is the best option for this patient. Michigan, as uh, Dr. Lavaki mentioned, offers a myriad of uh, options for those patients with COPD, and every patient um, could be considered to any of or, uh, any of those options if they meet criteria. So it's just not everybody's going here for valves, transplant, lung volume reduction. No, we discuss among ourselves what is the best option for this patient, how we can improve their lives better. Yeah, exactly. It is a multidisciplinary approach. And basically, all these doctors with this expertise, you know, in, in, in uh, COPD and, uh, and thoracic disease, uh, put their brains together to see what would be the best option or options 
for uh, a, uh, any, any, any given patient. So we review all uh, the data that we have in details. And I must say that COPD is a very um, heterogeneous uh, condition, meaning uh, not, no two people with COPD you know, will be the same in terms of their symptom burden, their CAT scan findings, their breathing test findings, et cetera. And therefore, uh, it, uh, uh, we have to look at each individual case to determine what possible options uh, would, would be offered for them. And this could only be best done through a multidisciplinary approach when doctors from multiple different specialties sit together and think about each individual case. And like Dr. De Cardenas said, this is uh, our um, uh, multidisciplinary conference that occurs twice a year. Yes, thank you very much for mentioning that, Dr. De Cardenas. Um, the next question that I have is what does the Zephyr valve procedure entail? What actually happens during the procedure? So uh, um, the first thing to remember is that um, if um, it's uh, done under general anesthesia and uh, otherwise it will be quite uncomfortable and uh, most likely Janice will have spanked my hand if I have done without, uh, without anesthesia. So um, the procedure is quite simple, but again, it's everything about patient selection and having a follow-up a teamwork. Um, so it's basically um, the patient comes to our bronchoscopy suite and the patient is checked by our anesthesiology and anesthesiology team. And also one of the good things at Michigan is that our patients are very special. Patients with COPD will also go through a, pre-anesthesia evaluation that is done remotely. The patients do not need to come, but this is also another check of another layer of safety for everyone. Um, so the patient is um, goes into the uh, bronchoscopy suite. Um, it's, the patient is gonna be under a general anesthesia with a grid connected to a breathing machine for approximately one hour. And, and the first thing that we do once the patient is asleep is go with a tiny camera take a look at both lungs, right and left. We clean the airways because we all produce mucus. And we check with a tiny balloon to confirm what the CAT scan already has suggested. Is the patient a candidate for the endobronchial valves? Um, why? Because um, one thing that also we wanted to point out, why to have a CAT scan is because with a CAT scan, we see if there is separation between the upper part of the lung and the lower part there has to be complete separation. Otherwise, the air, despite the valves being in place, the air will leak around, will, will connect, will pass from the lower or from the upper part to the other one. So um, we inflate this balloon. We confirm that um, there is complete separation between the upper and lower part of the lung. And we put four to five valves, as we said. And then the patient wakes up. Um, the breathing tube is removed. The patient is checked usually within um, one hour uh, in our recovery area. The patient is admitted for at least three nights and we check every single day that the patient is doing okay with chest X-ray. Most importantly, again, is that it's just not, we do the procedure, we follow up those patients, right? And again, it's a team approach how we do this. Um, we have our um, clinical specialist here present also in the meeting who calls every day the patient for the next 10 days to ensure that once the patient is discharged, she's doing okay. If there is any concern from the, from her or from, his pers from the patient perspective. Additionally, we follow up um, once the discharge has been done, the patient is checking our clinic two weeks after to ensure that they are doing okay. And then four weeks after the, um, so a second visit as an outpatient post-procedure in order to make sure that um, the valves are working properly, answer any question from the patient and as well assess, can this patient restart pulmonary rehabilitation, which is also important, right? And then we have a follow-up with the general pulmonologist, with the pulmonologist who have been following the patient and one year follow-up. Dr. Labaki, did I miss something? I think this was pretty thorough from, you know, from beginning to end. And uh, 
if any of uh, uh, um, of our audience members uh, have any more specific questions about the process, we would certainly be happy to hear those questions. Thank you both for that. Um, next couple of questions. How long does the procedure take and what is recovery time like? Uh, the procedure takes around one hour. Um, um, the observation is usually three nights. The patients are discharged fourth or fourth day or fifth day after. Um, and I think that uh, maybe Janice can tell us more how was her experience uh, in terms of recovering. How many weeks took you? Had a problem with the mute button. Um, my recovery was, uh, I woke up and said, are you done already? And I was already in my bed. And I'm thinking that day they got me out of bed. And we start walking and recovery every day was better and better. And I was stronger and stronger and fooling with my oxygen sneaking it off, sneaking it back on. And um, not only that, but I did feel the pressure off my diaphragm. I really did. And there's other certain things that happens when your diaphragm pushes everything, you know, and I felt that pressure off of there and I just felt better. I could, I could you know, I could sneak to the window without my oxygen. I'll tell you what, those nurses were fabulous. I don't know who trained them, but they were fabulous. And then I would sneak back to bed and you just feel so much better. It's, it's really hard to imagine that you can do that kind of stuff, even the little things like that, that you couldn't do before without, well, let's say you couldn't get back to your bed because, but I did, you know, and every day was better and better. And when I got home, it was even better because I started doing things I really wanted to do. I wanted to go outside without my oxygen. I wanted to go down on the deck. I wanted to swim. I wanted my grandkids over. It's just a miracle. These valves are a miracle. And I heard somebody say, well, you know, how old can you be or it's extenuating circumstances? I went in with worried to death because I only had one kidney. And Dr. Kadita said, no, don't worry, man, we're going to keep you hydrated. My wife said, keep you hydrated. And there was no problems, you know, no, no problems. I just cannot stress enough to people to get the test, go to the UM, get the test and pray you're eligible. Your life will turn around 100%. Believe me, it will. Thank you, Jenny, for yep. for your words. It's um, uh, I'm, we're extremely, extremely happy that you 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 are living better with all this. Um, I think that also just to add, um, that every patient is different. It might take a couple of weeks, right? And some patients, uh, one of the funny things, not funny, but uh, and they have experiencing a lot of this because the diaphragm, it goes a little bit higher and has bigger space. Um, the patient says that um, the early satiety, the early filling of their food with food, it doesn't occur anymore, right? Um, so is on um, some other patients because the chest, the chest wall is having a new configuration and changes. They have some, um, some kind of back pain as well. Um, but that's usually very mild, very, very mild. And we usually treat just with uh, um, medications with NSAIDs like ibuprofen or Tylenol. Um, uh, but usually it takes a couple of weeks. Remember what we used to do as a big surgery many years ago, we're doing it now bronchoscopically with tiny cameras, with uh, very small, uh, um, with minimal invasive um, approaches. And therefore, it's something that I also stress out to our patients. Do not run, <laughs> right, immediately. It's going to take a couple of days for recovery, and every patient is different. That's why, again, follow up, keeping in touch with our team, our team contacting you, 
right, uh, are very, very important. Thank you so much for that, all three of you. Uh, Janice, I have a question for you. You touched on this a little bit, but what would you tell other patients considering this treatment? Well, what I would say, the amount of time the testing take, takes is nothing compared to the lifetime you're going to receive after this operation. A lot of people think, I don't want to do this test. I don't want to do that test. I want to do this test. Do them. Go to the U of M. Get this done. See if you qualify. My life has, has completely turned around, and I'm so thankful for the suffer pals and my two doctors, my many doctors, actually. And even Catherine, <laughs> you know, Catherine is a coordinator who kept me excited. And I was, but please just get the test, get it done. You know, recovery time is so short and it gets better every day. You have to, you have to do it. That's all I can say is thank you, everybody. Thank you for inventing something so beautiful. Thank you very much, Janice. I think that was a fantastic insight. Um, doctors, what, what type of follow-up do patients like Janice need? Do they need any future procedures to maintain their quality of life at all? So um, uh, just to answer that question, I think uh, and just to reiterate, it's just another procedure about the follow-up. Um, we said um, a two-week follow-up in our clinic, usually with a chest X-ray and then um, six weeks or six weeks after the initial procedure, we repeat a CAT scan um, just for multiple reasons. One is to confirm that there is nice, good looking lung collapse. And second, um, also to see if the lung has not collapsed for whatever reason, um, we can study, do we need to revisit those valves? There is a, um, uh, uh, rarely, but again, this can happen is that once the valves are placed, they can migrate a leak, uh, migrate, move, or not seal completely. And therefore the patient needs what we call a revision. Um, that's not always a case. However, it can occur. And there is currently a studies uh, that are checking into this, um, but it's something that we always discuss with the patient. Um, in really rare cases, um, uh, it hasn't happened to us, but Again, it has been reported that the patients uh, will have um, infections uh, or pneumonias, and then we have to remove those valves as well, right? Um, but again, those are really rare cases, um, and that's why follow-up is important. Thank you very much for that, Dr. De Cardenas. Um, the next question that we have up, how many people have received the Zephyr valve procedure. Do you see this as becoming a prevalent treatment for COPD? Was him? Yeah, so uh, about 25,000 people have received the Zephyr valve globally. And uh, yes, uh, we, we do see this becoming more of a mainstay treatment as long as it is done uh, in the right patient with COPD. And uh, Along those lines, I would like to encourage all uh, patients, you know, to get educated about COPD, to uh, use helpful resources uh, provided by the American Lung Association, the COPD Foundation, you know, and other uh, patient organizations, uh, because we do know that uh, there are millions and millions of people living with COPD, yet, yet, uh, many of them, you know, close to half of them are not diagnosed. And this is sometimes because their shortness of breath is attributed to other factors like old age or physical deconditioning. Whereas in fact, you know, they would have uh, uh, chronic lung disease, COPD, for example. So please get educated about COPD and then uh, get, uh, get the necessary assessments you need, including the breathing tests, which are very simple to do, you know, uh, take about 15 minutes, 
can be done in many doctor's offices. So you know, you know, whether you have COPD or not. And if you do, you know, based on its severity and its manifestations, you can receive adequate treatment for it. And in the case of severe COPD with emphysema specifically, uh, uh, be considered for uh, the Zephyr valve treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, this this seems like quite an advancement. What do you see in the future of COPD treatment? Yeah, so um, we, um, we have made uh, quite a bit of progress on the COPD front over the past, uh, you know, 20 years or so. That being said, uh, we uh, new therapies are still sorely needed. Uh, uh, given, you know, how prevalent COPD is and uh, uh, how much of, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, morbidity and mortality is associated with it. So um, a lot of uh, different uh, therapies are currently being tested, and these include both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies. For example, there are medications that are uh, given through subcutaneous injections that decrease certain kinds of inflammation that could benefit people with COPD. And uh, these are uh, being tested through clinical trials. And we have one starting uh, soon at the University of Michigan. And also there are some uh, interventional therapies. Uh, uh, you know, the same way that the Zephyr valve is an interventional therapy that can be done through bronchoscopies. For example, for example, there is one called targeted lung denervation. And basically this is a procedure done bronchoscopically. And we work very closely with Dr. the Cardenas team on, on this uh, uh, clinical trial that is currently ongoing to basically go inside the airways and uh, pretty much like uh, uh, burn some of the active nerves around these airways. That way the tone inside these airways is decreased and can result you know, in breath, better breathing and a lower frequency of flare up. So for example, this is one therapy being tested. Other therapies being tested for people with severe COPD, but not necessarily the emphysema kind of COPD, but the chronic bronchitis kind of COPD, which is basically severe uh, disease at the level of the airways, where uh, you could uh, uh, basically uh, destroy the diseased cells inside those airways, whether through electromagnetic fields, or through uh, uh, a cryotherapy, which is basically applying very uh, cold temperatures to these cells to remove these diseased cells and allow airways to generate new healthy cells from scratch. And these would be treatments targeted for people with COPD with predominantly airway disease as, as opposed to lung tissue disease. So uh, there are new therapies being tested in the pipeline for COPD. Uh, we, we definitely need more, you know, we, we, we are not done in our quest to improve uh, people's uh, lives and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, improve their um, uh, overall lung health, but uh, stay tuned for more and hopefully the future will bring even more therapies just like, uh, you know, the Zephyr Valve. Fantastic. Well, I'm, it's been a real privilege having all three of you on here. We have about a minute left. Doctors, I always reach out at the end of our live streams and say, do you have any final comments? Have we missed anything? Any final thoughts from either of you uh, uh, that you might have about COPD or the Zephyr valve treatment? Um, nothing, just check with your pulmonology. If you're short of breath, you have a smoke, you suspect that you have COPD, check, inquire with your doctor first, with your pulmonologist, right? With a breathing test, with the basic tests. Um, check also your compliance, right? And if you are unable to be compliant, work with your doctor, how this can be improved, right? That's the, those are the primary steps. Quit smoking, do pulmonary rehab, right? And if your doctor thinks that you might benefit if you're close to a, a, an academic center or a place that does um, endobronchial valves, please check that out if you're around Michigan right? Come to us. We're happy to take care of you. Yes, cannot agree more. Uh, you know, talk to your doctors, get, get educated, you know, about uh, uh, COPD or any other lung disease that you may have. Uh, and uh, uh, that way you better understand what your condition is. And working closely uh, with your doctors, uh, define a, a management plan that works for you and will help improve your lung health down the road. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. DeCardinus. Thank you, Dr. Labaki. Of course, thank you, Janice, so much for providing your perspective. It's been a real privilege having all three of you. And thank you to, uh, to our viewers for all of these questions. Everybody have a good afternoon. Thank you.